Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be thinking about making better use of dynamics. Now this is something that's particularly going to be an issue for performers but it's something for composers to think about as well. Now what do I mean by this? Because surely if it says F in the music you play it loud, if it says P you play it quiet, you know it's pretty obvious isn't it? The composer tells us what he or she wants and we just get on with it. Well okay at a very basic level that is certainly true. Though it's amazing actually how many performances you hear that are being played perfectly accurately in terms of notes and rhythms and so on but actually you notice that the dynamics are not really coming across with great clarity. Now that could be simply because someone isn't paying enough attention to them. I think it could also be for another reason and this is always something to watch out for. Sometimes when we perform something we kind of internalize things without really making them that obvious to the outside world. So we imagine that we're playing something louder or quieter but actually it's not really coming across. And I know that sometimes I've recorded myself play, particularly in advance of a concert or something, and I think I'm delivering dynamics and when I hear it played back I think actually they're not as clear as I thought they were. Maybe the recordings squash the dynamics a bit, could be that, or just maybe that I'm sort of thinking and feeling these things inside but they're not quite coming across. So it's a good thing just to sort of check out the obvious if you like. How, if it says forte, is that really a forte that I'm producing? And comparing like with like because that's something I find is often a trap. You look at a, a passage of maybe mezzo forte MF writing near the beginning of a piece, a few pages later there's another passage that's also marked MF and when you put the two little passages alongside each other you realize actually you're playing this MF a little bit louder than you're playing the other one and it's a good thing just to kind of match up things of different dynamic levels. It's something I love to do when I'm practicing myself and when I'm teaching is to say let's put together all the passages that are marked piano or MP or MF or FF whatever it is. Let's make sure they've all kind of matched up reasonably well and then we can kind of gauge everything else from there because sometimes that just kind of moves out of kilter a bit. But I'm really wanting to focus in this video on something more subtle than that because sometimes we've got to do something with dynamics that maybe the composer hasn't even indicated. And I'm going to use a very famous example. So what you can see on the screen here is this Traumerei piece by, by Schumann. Uh, the title as you can see means dreaming. And when you look at this it's all beautiful piece and lots of people love to hear it and to play it. What do you see in the score in terms of dynamics? Well at the beginning it says P. Where does it change? Doesn't change anywhere. There's phrasing marked in the score, there's uh, you know, various bits of ritardando and so on, but it's all piano. So what do I do? Do I think okay this is my level of decibels for piano and every single note is going to be exactly the same. Well let me suggest that that would not be a very great way to play the piece really. What he's really saying here is that in the sequence of pieces that this comes from this is going to be a quiet movement. But it doesn't mean play exactly piano from start to finish. So actually there's quite a bit of responsibility left to us as the performer to work out well what are we going to do with that. On balance it needs to feel as if it's quiet, it's dreamy, it's reflective, that's the mood of the piece. But we are going to have to inject dynamic shape to make this work. Doesn't mean we're suddenly going to play forte, it just means we're going to put some subtle dynamic shape into the piece. So we follow the direction of it. Now when I look at this score what's going to help me decide how I'm going to do that? Well it may be the melody. There's quite often a natural rise and fall in a melody that encourages us to get a bit louder as we go up, get a bit quieter as we come down. Now don't take that in some religious way so you always get louder when it goes higher, you always get louder when it gets quieter, uh, get quieter when it comes down. I don't mean that at all. I'm meaning that sometimes the contour of a line suggests some dynamic shape. 
But there are other things as well, aren't there? Like, for example, you notice in this piece at the end of bar four, everything kind of comes to a standstill, but the bass line gets busy for a moment. So whereas the bass line hasn't been terribly exciting melodically to that point, suddenly there's a chance, isn't there, just to say, that bass line could just be a little bit louder than everything else. The bass line itself in that corner might have a sort of rise and fall shape, you know. Actually, there is that little crescendo written under the stave just before that, isn't there? So he has put a crescendo in there, we'll give him that. Um, but other places where the bass does that, at the end of bar eight, there's a little bit of activity there, you know. Is that gonna get louder? Is it gonna get quieter? Maybe it's going to just kind of be a little bit more prominent and then it's going to get a bit quieter as it kind of melts back into the bass line. Uh, you know, so we can think about the subtleties of that. Maybe there are moments in the middle parts where there's something going on that's a bit more interesting melodically or rhythmically when the melody is just sitting still for a moment. So there's lots of stuff that's in the music that's making us think, hmm, actually, yeah, rise and fall in the melody. Bit of movement in one of the lower parts that I could just draw a bit of attention to. Sometimes the chords are a bit thicker than in other places. That might indicate a bit of rise and fall in tension that we can paint in the dynamics. Sometimes you get kind of ordinary chords. Sometimes you get more dramatic chords. I mean, at the beginning, you know, this is a chord of F major. Well, we're in the key of F major, so it's a tonic chord in F. Nothing terribly surprising about that. We don't particularly need to bang it out, do we? We don't need to play. There's no reason to draw attention to that chord. Later on, though, you might think, well, actually, when we get into bar 11, well, from bar 10, maybe, we've got a phrase there where there's more interesting harmony. You know, bar, bar 9 starts off in this F major chord again. That's sort of a moment of repose, isn't it? And it all just sits down quite quietly there. And there's a natural diminuendo as we're holding on to that. But then we have a rising thing that could get louder. But listen to that chord. Whoa, that's quite a kind of strong chord, isn't it? And then going on, we've got an ordinary chord there. We've got a more chromatic chord there, what we call a diminished seventh. We might want to draw attention to that. So there are places where there's more drama happening in the harmony and the chords, and that might be an indication just to draw that out by raising the dynamic temperature a little bit. So think about what's happening melodically, what's happening rhythmically, what's happening in the lower parts, what's happening in the harmony or the key movement, what's happening in the phrase structure. When do we come to the end of a phrase and it just wants to have a sense of repose at the end of a phrase? What happens when we're getting kind of busy and active in the middle of the phrase? Do you see how all these things might indicate some dynamic direction, some dynamic variation? But by the time we get to the end of the movement, we want to feel that actually overall, it has been quiet and it's painted this dreamy title, but we haven't all gone to sleep because the whole thing's just boring on one level. So, you know, if we go through some of this piece, so we start quietly, because that's what he's asking us to do. So there's a nice quiet start and I've got the key established. It's all quite kind of steady. A bit of melody on the move. You can see that melody is going up to that peak. So I've done a slight crescendo to get there. And then maybe I can step back a little bit. And then maybe get a little bit louder as we're getting busy there. But then let the bass part come through. And then let the bass part diminuendo as I pass the focus back to the top part again. Crescendo maybe more of a crescendo than we did at the beginning because it's gone higher and the chord is more dramatic, isn't it? We've got a sort of movement in, towards D minor and then get the focus back onto the melody now here. There's a more chromatic chord, but I'm fitting that more intimately. So I'm personally going to play that a bit quieter. And then a kind of bit more colour there. And we're heading towards a cadence where he's written writ, so I'm getting quieter. Let the bass come through a bit. And then we're going to go back and repeat all of that. So again, I'm building 
up a little bit to focus that moment and then I'm letting it subside a bit build up a little bit let that left hand come through a bit let the bass speak to us and then melt away again then let the top line crescendo enjoy that chord isn't it wonderful and then on we go colourful chords a bit more intimate the hands closer together and you can see we've modulated to C major, the dominant key there. So as a moment of repose, the bass just comes through a little bit. On we go to bar nine. It's the same as the opening, so let's play it the same way, that's fine. And then we're on the rise again, but there's something different happening now. Kind of more crunchy chord, but we're on the move. Ten minutes, seven. Relaxing into the cadence, maybe a bit of bass comes through, and then enjoy that low note in the bass. But pass the baton back to the top part, and then a more dramatic chord, so a bit louder for that. We're higher up here, diminished seventh, drama in the harmony, movement in the rhythm. We're reflecting that retard end of the cadence slow down get quieter repose because we're going back to this opening thing again aren't we a little bit of a rise there painting that with a slight crescendo not as dramatic as before so i'm being a bit more reflective but using a bit of dynamic shape here comes the left hand Now, a bit more of a crescendo in the right hand because look at this great moment of drama there with that wonderful chord there, that G9 chord. So that's a moment of climax. Then we kind of hold on to that pause and then we let it go. And then we've got a ritardando, we're slowing down and we're kind of letting the dynamics kind of come down as well. So we really feel by the time we get to the end something very dreamy relaxed a sense of repose and the dynamics just help to paint all that so it's a great piece in a way i'm sort of feeling bad about destroying the piece by talking over it but what i'm trying to do is to say gosh isn't there a great deal we can do with dynamics within that piece that make the difference between it being kind of just a rather boring representation of notes and something that has an ability to really communicate and speak to the audience. Now, it's not just about dynamics, it's about <clears throat> balancing the textures, you know, are there notes in the texture that are more important that want to be louder than accompanying notes? I've tried to do a bit of that. It's combining with the phrasing, it's combining with possibilities for rubato, you know, tempo variation. So all these things, belong together. But I'm hoping what I've tried to demonstrate anyway is that dynamics actually make a huge impact. And it isn't just what's marked in the score, it's then your capacity to interpret what's there and to offer dynamic shape to the music. So the music is always traveling somewhere. Never let a performance stand still. People disengage as soon as that happens but think about how you're going to give it dynamic shape. We're always going somewhere, we're traveling to there or we're traveling back down again to make lots of color and variety in the performance. So I hope that's a little helpful uh, video on thinking about the detail of how we can use dynamics to great expressive purpose.